In this video, we're going to take a look at working with the specular material, or at least the basics of working with the specular material in Octane for Cinema 4D. And for this video, I'm using the materials underscore 01.c4dc that you can download with the projects. So let's go into the Octane menu and choose Octane Live Viewer. And let's render the scene. So in this scene, of course, we have our little sci-fi structure and we have our four spheres. And we have the diffuse material applied to this sphere, glossy applied to this one, specular applied to this one, and metallic applied to this one. And we're interested in looking at the specular material. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select this object. Let's raise it up and let's uh, scale it up. Something like that, and then so we can sort of see through the surface. So you can see the specular material is great for doing transparent surfaces, like transparent liquids or glass or plastic and so on. It's also really good for doing surfaces that have subsurface scattering. So like human skin or candle wax or jade or things like that. Um, so let's take a look at the settings for this material. So let's go to, uh, materials, octane node editor to open up the node editor. And I'm going to drag this material in here. And let's take a look at it in the node editor. Let's do this real quick. There we go. Now, whenever you're using a specular material, uh, you want to pay attention to the render kernel that you're using. So let's go into Octane settings. And for this scene, I have it set to, for this scene, I have the kernel set to direct lighting. If I switch to path tracing, you'll see that there is a slight difference. It can be quite dramatic when you're looking at things like caustic uh, light patterns and that kind of thing. And sometimes it's a bit more subtle. But the path tracing and PMC kernels are going to be more physically accurate than direct lighting. So sometimes when you're working with the specular material, if you have direct lighting set as your kernel, you might not be getting the precise results that you want. Uh, so in that case, always double check. Go to the kernel setting and try path tracing. So let's set this to path tracing for now. And I'll close this and then select the material and let's take a look at the settings. So the specular material has some of the uh, settings here that are also found in the glossy and diffuse materials. So if I've already talked about those settings in previous movies, I'm gonna kind of skip over them in this movie. Just focus on those settings that have the most dramatic effect on the way the material looks. So let's zoom in here again so we can see through it. And if I select the material, of course, you can see the material type is set to specular. So that's the most important thing. And you'll notice that there is not a diffuse channel. So unlike glossy and the diffuse material, there's no diffuse channel. There's roughness and reflection are the top two options here. So if we take a look at roughness, if I increase the float value, you can see that it's creating sort of a slightly rougher surface, which spreads out the specular highlight, but also affects the refraction. So you get something that looks kind of like frosted glass or plastic uh, when you adjust the, the um, the roughness, and of course you can also put a texture in here using this slot right here. Let's bring roughness down to zero and take a look at reflection. So reflection, if I increase this, it will increase the intensity of the reflections you see on the surface. In some ways this is means that you know light is bouncing off of the surface and not going through the surface. So technically speaking, if you have a strong reflection, it can interfere with the transparency or the refraction. Uh, that you see through the surface. So you kind of want to balance your reflection settings with your um, refraction and roughness settings. But again, it totally depends on the look that you're going for. Um, but I'm going to lower this to say something at like 0.6 and then go back to roughness and increase the roughness a little bit, the value. And you can see that with a little bit of roughness, the reflections become more apparent, especially the reflection of the sun there. And now as I adjust the amount of reflection, it's going to affect that. 
So I bring this to a very low value. You can see we don't get much reflection. It's almost completely non-existent and we're just getting kind of that roughness. If I bring it all the way to zero, kind of we see the reflection at full strength. So you either want to put this at a very low, low value like 0 0.001 or put it at a value above that. But a value of zero is kind of freaky in the way that it works. So let's go back to roughness here and decrease this a little bit, just get a nice slight roughness to it. So it's just a little bit of a blurred refraction there. Let's check out anisotropy. So anisotropy works the same way it does in the glossy material. So I'll just go over this fairly quickly. If I increase it and I don't see much of a change here in terms of the way the highlight is spread across the surface, Go to the basic settings and set the BRDF model to either Beckman, GGX, then you'll get a more realistic looking anisotropy. So now if I set this to Beckman, it looks like my highlights disappeared, but let's go back to anisotropy and bring it up a little bit and then also go into roughness and increase the roughness a little bit. And now you can see that highlight. It's kind of spread across the surface, but you also notice that it's reflecting the refraction. So let's go back to anisotropy and then we can, let's go into the textures here and create a float. And I'm gonna connect this float to rotation. Now I can start to adjust the rotation of that anisotropic highlight as well as the anisotropy in the refractions. And then I can go back here and adjust the amount of anisotropy See, it spreads out the highlight a little bit. Also, the roughness and the reflection will affect that highlight. So if I increase the roughness, it really spreads it out. If I decrease it, we get much more of a subtle kind of quality and a tighter highlight. Next, let's take a look at the film layer. This works the same way as it does in the glossy material. If I increase the float, you can see that it's adding a little bit of a color there to the refractions and the specular highlight, kind of like a thin film is on top of the surface and then of course I can adjust the film index of refraction separately from the film amount. Let's take a look at fake shadows. Before I do that let's set anisotropy back to zero and let's set the roughness down to say zero so we have a perfectly transparent surface. And I'm going to rotate this and let's move this down a little bit so that we can see the shadows. Let's move this out of the way. There we go. And let's move this out of the way. So now we just so we can see the shadow here that's being cast by the surface. So as you can see, as it's rendering, you can see here's the shadow cast by our specular surface. And this right here is the caustic light pattern, which is being calculated at the moment. So you see this bright highlight right here. Um, that's going to be affected by the index of refraction. If I go to the index of refraction, which is index right here, let's set this to say 1.1. It's not quite so refractive, and you can see here is the caustic light pattern as is being rendered in the uh, Octane Viewer. Now, the reason I wanted to do this is so that we could take a look at how fake shadows work. So if I go to fake shadows, by default they're off, meaning that the shadows cast when you're rendering with path tracing or PMC and a transparent, or I should say a specular surface, you get physically accurate caustics without having to do much else. Um, you can, of course, adjust this so it takes a little bit less time to render, but e either way, you're getting physically based shadows. If I turn fake shadows on, then that gets rid of the caustic light pattern, and we see something that we'd expect more from like a rendering of architectural glass. So if I go in here and let's bring the reflection value down and go to, um, Let's go to transmission and increase transmission, which increases the transparency. And you can see that it increases the transparency of the shadow. You see a little bit of darkness along the edges here and that can be affected by the index of refraction. If I set index of refraction to say something like 
you can see it affects the shadow but this is still not a physically accurate shadow but it's an aesthetically pleasing one which again can be used to either speed up the render in places where you don't care about physically accurate shadows or if you're rendering like an architectural visualization and you want to use that kind of architectural glass as opposed to this kind of thick thick glass that uh, that the material creates by default okay so let's go back to fake shadows and turn off fake shadows now bump normal and displacement work the same way they do for the diffuse and glossy materials i'm going to skip these settings for the moment we also have another video devoted just to bump normal and displacement so check those out so i'm going to skip those and let's go to opacity i mentioned opacity in the movies on uh, both diffuse and glossy materials it essentially creates sort of a cutout transparency. So if I bring the float down, the model disappears and the shadow becomes more transparent. If I bring it up, we can see more of the object in the scene. This setting is used primarily with a texture to create things like a gobo cutout or something like that. So kind of a intricate edges that you don't necessarily want to model and you want to handle just through a texture. So um, let's take out dispersion. As I increase dispersion, this is going to kind of affect the way that the wavelengths of light are split up in the refraction as they pass through the surface. Let's go over here. So we're getting, again, it's kind of like a rainbow effect within the surface. And you can bring this down or up, depending on what you're trying to do. And if I bring out the roughness just a little bit, you can start to see that color in the refractions a little bit more. Let's go back to dispersion. Let's set this down to zero. Take a look at index. Of course, this is the index of refraction. So this is probably the most important setting in the specular material. This controls essentially how light bends as it passes through the transparent surface. So if I set this to one, then we have essentially the same index of refraction uh, of air in a vacuum. So let's set that to one and let's go to transmission and set the transmission all the way out to one. Let's go to roughness and set this down to zero. And you can see when we do this, the object disappears because it's just basically got the same index of refraction as air. So if we go back to index here, and if I set this to like 1.33, that's gonna be the index of refraction of water. And then I can go to roughness and bring this up a little bit to get kind of a highlight. We get something that looks a bit like a, well, that looks like a glass ball, but a little bit of roughness looks kind of like a water drop. As I mentioned in the previous movie on glossy materials, if you need to find the accurate index of refraction of a particular material, you can go to pixelandpoly.com, ior.html. There's also many other sites in the internet that have a complete list of the index of refraction for various materials. So this is the value that we plug in to the IOR or the index setting on the specular material. So next we can look at transmission, which is, you can think of as the color of the transparency of the specular surface. So if I go into the transmission settings and let's bring up the saturation, or we could set this to RGB and pick a specific color, you can see how it affects the color of the transparency on the surface. And of course, you can also place a texture into this channel, RGB image texture, so for like stained glass or that kind of effect be really useful. Let's go back to HSV and I'm going to set the saturation to zero, the value all the way up to one, so we have 100% transparency. Next we have medium. This is how you would create subsurface scattering effects. Uh, there's going to be a separate movie that covers medium in more detail, uh, so I'm going to skip that setting for the time being. And then if we take a look at common, uh, of course we can turn on or off smooth. If we turn off smooth, we get the faceting of the original geometry. So if I turn on smooth, it smooths the normal, so we don't get that. We also have effect alpha. So if I go in here, let's do this. 
And let's take a look at the index. Let's set this down to 1.1. So if I go to, so if I turn on effect alpha, if we go into live viewer and take a look at the alpha channel, first we're not gonna see much because we need to turn on the alpha channel in the render settings. So let's set this back to path tracing and let's go to octane, octane settings, and let's turn on alpha channel. And now you can see when I turn on effect alpha. So this is effect alpha is turned off. If I turn it on, you can see that that refraction is included in the alpha channel. And just like with the glossy and diffuse material, we have rounded edge radius to create a slight bevel onto the edges of a surface, make it look a little bit less CG. Let's set the, uh, let's turn off alpha channel. And then the editor, of course, allows you to do things like turn on animated preview so that you can see the preview update as you make changes. And you can also look at the assign section to find out what surfaces have this material applied to it. So that's the basics of working with the speculative material in Octane for Cinema 4D.